Hi everyone and welcome back to Applied International Economic Policy. This is week five. We had a break uh, last week with the fire tag. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, today we're going to be speaking about secular stagnation and what that means and the implications of this uh, modern phenomenon. Um, so here's the overview of the lecture today. We'll begin by looking at the data on the matter of secular stagnation. We'll then be trying to explain um, through different theoretical approaches what um, secular stagnation or how secular, secular stagnation has come about. Uh, and in the end, we'll finish with some policy implications. Okay, but first of all, well, what is secular stagnation? And there's no better way, in my view, to uh, understand what secular stagnation is, other than to have a look at some data. So here we have some data on the real growth rates in various major economies around the world since 1960. Um, and each data point is a average of the five years that goes before that year. So it's a five year moving average. This is just there to reduce some of the volatility in the data, make the trends more apparent. Um, okay, so let's st start with Germany. Real growth rates in Germany since 1965 have clearly fallen over the last 60, 70, um, or 80 years even. So we have an average of around 4.8, above 4% for the first few years, and clearly this has only gone downwards. Real growth rates in Spain clearly have exhibited the same trend, and perhaps even um, to a greater extent. And if we go through the various major economies, here I've taken data from the European Commission's um, database. Um, and it hit, yeah, we see in Netherlands, the same story in the United Kingdom, um, to a lesser extent, but still very much the same story. Australia, Canada, Japan, quite remarkably uh, steep, this trend, and of course, a linear trend, as, as I've plotted it here, the line of best fits will do a bad job of forecasting real rates of growth um, in recent years, but it does a pretty good job at just showing how, um, how, how real growth rates have developed in Japan. Korea and the United States all show the same downward trend, and this is basically what is meant by the term secular stagnation. It's this long-term um, slow down in real growth rates um, seen um, in, may, in, in many major economies around the world. Not every economy, um, but some developing economies, of course, may show a different trend, but these industrialized major economies seem to show or exhibit the same downward trend or slow down in real growth rates. So why is this concerning? Why is this significant? Well, of course, slower growth is associated with other um, uh, undesirable economic outcomes. So through Occam's law, we would expect that well, a slowdown in growth may mean fewer jobs are being created, um, especially if we are worried about the indebtedness of governments um, or even uh, the private sector, then a slowdown of growth may mean that their ability to pay back debts in the future um, may be undermined. So we will have instability issues um, because, well, growth of income essentially allows for the payback of debt that has been taken out. So if we can't grow at the same high rates, that may mean we, um, or our economy may collapse. And a last point, I mean, we could go into further points, but the third and final point that I list here is simply, well, we have this growing inequality that we have seen in the last few weeks in our lectures um, and in our readings. Um, but this growing inequality increasingly does not seem to be compensated by um, a, a rising tide, as is often called. So some, um, I think Margaret Thatcher very famously said that she doesn't care about inequality so long as the poor are also getting richer. Um, it doesn't matter how fast the rich are getting richer, as long as the poor are getting richer as well, then inequality, the, the growing gap between poor and rich, uh, matters less, um, according, well, in, in her opinion, 
at that time. But what we're seeing is that well, inequality is growing while growth seems to be stagnating. Therefore, there isn't even this, or perhaps there is less of a compensatory role um, for higher levels of overall income. Um, okay, so these are three points I've mentioned. There may be some who say, well, there may be a positive side to secular stagnation. In particular here, those who uh, fall into the camp of thinking, well, we simply need to stop growing or even degrow or you know, reduce or have a negative um, growth, so a, an economic contraction in order to deal with issues of climate change. Um, well, in that case, you, know, you could see secular stagnation from a very different um, point of view. However, for the purposes of this, this lecture, um, we're gonna take on the much, I guess, more mainstream, I guess, concerns that I've listed here at the top. Okay, so the first theory that we're gonna look at is the, the mainstream theory. It's the, the, the most popular account of why secular stagnation is happening. And this is what is called the loanable funds theory for secular stagnation. So just a really uh, sort of short primer, uh, just remind ourselves of some basic um, macroeconomic concepts. Let's start by assuming a closed economy, so there's no trade, and we have no government in this setup. Here we have in this beautifully drawn diagram, um, we have the firms at the top here, and the households. And of course, the households own the firms, or the capitalists uh, within the households uh, own the firms and get profits in return. And the laborers provide their labor to the firms and get wages in return. With that income that comes into the households, these households then go on to spend this income in the form of consumption, or perhaps they will save it um, in a bank, and therefore this, this income, um, this part of income, will uh, exit the financial or exit the monetary system. Right? So this is a leakage in the form of saving, right? and investments is an injection back into the monetary system, into the economy. And we know that in a closed economy, with no governments, consumption plus investments must equal total income, right? So the output that is produced must be equal to the income that is generated. And if the sort of fundamental points that we just need to remind ourselves for the purposes of this presentation or this, this of entertaining this topic is that, well, we have leakages here, a demand leakage in the form of saving, because of course this is not going in to the purchase of new goods and services. Um, if these leakages are greater than the injections going back into the system, then it means the income that is generated will shrink. Therefore, if leakages are greater than injections, the economy will shrink and we will expect um, GDP to, well, to decrease, right? Okay, so that's just a sort of reminder of, of some basic fundamental concepts. So with this in mind, the question becomes, well, why might S be greater than I? Why might savings be growing and consumption falling, um, and therefore the sort of demand for the goods and services be falling, leading to lower incomes, and then that has the knock-on effect of in the next round as money continues to circulate throughout the monetary system. So why might this be the case? And this is the sort of fundamental question to keep in mind. Well, the mainstream approach um, typically uh, relies on the view that savings, the leakages, and investments, the injections of money back into the system, should be equal. And there is a um, a fairly um, popular uh, understanding of how this occurs, and those of you who have done plenty of macro before should be quite aware of this. If you're not, please do, um, yeah, well, um, look into this. So essentially, the neoclassical view, the mainstream view, is that savings and, and investments should be equal due to the operation of this market for loanable funds. Here on the x-axis, we have the quantity of loanable funds. And on the y-axis, we have the real interest rates. And in a sense, the real interest rate is essentially then the price um, for this good, as the neoclassicals would, would phrase it, which, uh, and the good in this case are loanable funds. 
if the real interest rate rises, we the, well the neoclassicals uh, suggest that the supply, the so savers would like to save more of their money essentially, because they will get a higher um, reward for saving. The uh, interest on the deposits will increase, so therefore, as the interest rate increases, we expect in this schedule um, that the amount of loanable funds, the supply of loanable funds, will go up like this. On the other hand, if we consider the point of view of the investors, it's the opposite situation. As the real interest rate falls, the demand for loanable funds and um, we would expect to increase, right? Because these investors um, have to face less cost uh, for taking out a loan for investment purposes when the real interest rate falls. Now, at the intersection between the supply of loanable funds and the demand for loanable funds, we have an equilibrium which should give rise to the equilibrium interest rates. Now, this is what is referred to uh, as the natural rate of interest because somehow it's supposed to be this rate of interest um, which is, uh, is, is, is the equilibrium rates um, made by the, the interaction of these two forces of supply and demand. Um, and at the same time we have uh, a sort of reasoning or a rationale for why the neoclassicals suppose that usually savings will equal investment. Okay, so this is the basis for why, in a sense, the neoclassicals believe that uh, the system should be left alone. In, in you know, most cases, you should leave the system alone because there are these uh, natural forces that keep um, leakages and, in and injections equal such that the monetary system should continue to circulate um, uh, freely and, and grow, right? So then how could they explain or how could there be a mainstream explanation as to how um, secular stagnation could occur where leakages are greater than injections? Well, the fairly common or popular explanation that has been put forward is often attributed to Larry Summers and his speech he gave to I think it was the IMF in 2013, where he said, kind of building on the ideas of Ben Bernanke, in the 2000s, who were saying, well, there's, there's excess saving going on in uh, the world economy. This is represented in our loanable funds diagram by a rightward shift of the schedule of saving or the supply of loanable funds. Um, it, it, with a high enough sort of um, glut, a high enough uh, amount of excess saving, the theory is, at least, that there is now a negative natural interest rate, where this interest rate is below zero. Right? But, of course, um, nominal interest rates are regarded as being uh, um, at the lower bound or having a lower bound of zero. So in order to get to this negative interest rate, you would either need a you would need a combination of a, a zero nominal interest rate plus a high rate of inflation to ensure you can actually achieve this negative natural interest rate. So this is essentially the argument that some has put forward is that um, you cannot achieve this neg negative natural interest rates, um, or we are not achieving it, and therefore we're in a case where because of this zero lower bound savings here are greater than investment. And therefore, we have leakages out of the monetary system greater than the injections back into the monetary system and um, we have that stagnant growth, right? Okay, so this is the sort of mainstream approach that Summers has put forward. Essentially, it's all about this loanable funds markets and ensuring um, that we, we hit our natural rates of interest. However, because of the zero lower bound um, and, apprehensive, uh, and apprehension to go beyond or try to go beyond the zero lower bound, we simply um, are left in this situation. 
But it does raise a question, um, which is, well, why would uh, people be uh, saving so much, such that we have this glut of saving, this excess supply of saving? Well, um, so yeah, it, this is essentially what's written here. What is causing this chronic, as in long-term, excess um, saving? Well, Bernanke, a few years prior, um, had already kind of popularized this global savings glut hypothesis, and he, in his own writing and speeches, put forward the idea that we have in, well, major um, industrialized economies, aging populations, um, and uh, declining, well, workforces. So fewer people are being born, workforces are shrinking, those that are alive are, um, well, aging, such that people within these economies must save more simply in order to be able to live at a certain level uh, or, or standard of, of living at, in later years. And typically Japan and Germany are the economies most often referenced in, these, in this sort of points. But Bernanke always puts forward other reasons. So uh, we're looking at developing economies on the other hand, uh, he mentions the strategic reserves that certain, in particular East Asian economies, um, use in order to manage their exchange rates, in order to pursue um, their managed exchange rates trade policies. Um, he mentions the, the, fact, the fact that at the time, at least, perhaps not today, but with oil, uh, higher oil prices, it meant those oil-dependent countries simply had uh, excess, um, excess income which is a form of saving in these economies. But then, uh, I guess, more sort of Keynesian point is the idea, well, that the US dollar is this uh, most liquid form of currency or liquid assets. Um, if you are in a developing economy where uh, you are not sure if your currency will hold its value, then perhaps you are more likely, rather than investing within your own economy, simply getting as many US dollars as you can and holding those US dollars because you know they are likely to um, hold their value, right? So we have different reasons why the um, industrialized economies and developing economies may have some reasons uh, to, to save more, for people in those economies to save more. And this is at least the hypothesis that Bernanke puts forward. Um, even from a mainstream perspective, uh, some authors, I think Krugman amongst them, has put forward, well, the, the, the idea that, well, um, inequality could also be driving this high rate of saving because, well, the richest in society have so much money that they simply, you know, could not spend all of it, right? So this, this idea, although Bernanke does not mention it, has also been kind of tacked on to the global saving glut um, hypothesis. Generally, those among the New Keynesians in the mainstream um, school have argued, as with Krugman, that fiscal policy is the way out to, uh, of, this, um, of this secular stagnation trap, if you like. So just going back to our diagram, um, if you remain within the loanable funds uh, approach, then yeah, you can simply increase the investment schedule through public spending, public investments, and you should then be able to have a, na a natural rate of interest, which is achievable for positive rates, right? On top of that, the idea is, well, if it does in uh, cause inflation, that will only help um, lower the, uh, well, bring the, the rate of interest um, below the zero level bounds, because of course, um, the real rate is the nominal rate minus inflation. So if inflation goes up, then perhaps you might even uh, hit the negative actual interest rate. So that's the sort of um, mainstream approach of explaining this global saving glut hypo uh, hypothesis as an as a explanation of the secular stagnation um, problem. Now, so this is one approach, but there are many reasons that we um, there are many problems that we can find with it. And that's what we'll be doing in the next parts of this lecture. Um, 
Okay, so we'll take a little break here and then continue with the next part.